Good evening and thank you for joining us for Crimson News at 6. I'm Mark Hanrahan and I'm Whitney Ward. We begin tonight as police have captured a man accused of opening fire at a Fred Meyer in Richland yesterday. 39 year old Aaron Christopher Kelly is the one suspected of killing one person and critically injuring another. He's now invoked his rights not to answer police questions. Police eventually caught up with him in Moses Lake early this morning, more than 12 hours after the shooting. Now with him behind bars, the community is starting to settle. Creme Kyle Simchuk is in Richland tonight with how the community is coming together. Well, yeah, Mark, the local Red Cross here is seeing a surge of people wanting to donate blood following this tragedy. Tonight we're learning more about the victims and what exactly took place inside this store. Richland police say 39 year old Aaron Kelly pulled out a handgun and started shooting two minutes after entering the Fred Meyer store. I was helping someone with their groceries, um, putting them in their trunk when my boss and a bunch of people started running outside and saying run run there's an active shooter. A chaotic scene as customers and employees scramble to safety. Emotions pouring out in the parking lot. We heard a couple pops thinking okay it might have been a couple of balloons popping somewhere and then we heard another another few and people running saying shots fired shots fired ducking and running out the doors. Kelly was arrested by U.S. Marshals near Moses Lake early this morning. He appeared before a judge this afternoon charged with first degree murder and attempted murder. Acquaintances of Kelly have described his condition to investigators as being in decline over the last few weeks and months. He has been described as distancing himself from friends and family. He had a brief conversation with 38 year old Justin Crumbaugh before allegedly pulling out a handgun and shooting him to death. A GoFundMe set up for Crumbaugh's family has raised nearly $22,000 in less than 24 hours. A second victim, a Fred Meyer employee, remains in critical condition. Police say there's no evidence that Kelly knew any of the men he shot. Again, there are no words to adequately express our sorrow for the victims and their families regarding this senseless act of violence resulting in the loss of innocent life. And this Fred Meyer is still closed and will be for several days. You can see some of that police yellow crime tape still up around the parking lot. Reporting in Richland tonight, Kyle Simchuk, Creme 2 News. And while the community there continues to mourn, we are also learning more tonight about the gunman himself. What police say led up to that deadly shooting? Kelly faced a judge for the first time today. Our Amanda Rowley has more on his first appearance, plus what led police to Kelly. Well, Aaron Kelly is charged with murder and attempted murder following the shooting at Fred Meyer. In fact, court documents led us to the suspect's ex roommate who identified him for police. Benton County court documents detail events surrounding the shooting at Fred Meyer. Records say when Richland police arrived at the store, they found two people with gunshot wounds and several 9mm casings near them. Investigators watched store surveillance footage that shows Kelly entering the store with a cart. They say he had a brief conversation in an aisle with the first victim before repeatedly shooting them with a handgun. That victim, identified as Justin Crumbaugh, died at the scene. Kelly then shot a second victim near customer service before leaving the store. This all happened within seven minutes. When I called them, I basically said, I don't want to be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's Aaron. Investigators say the suspect's ex-roommate identified Kelly after police posted his photo on social media. Bryant Scott told police Kelly has been spiraling mentally and described him as paranoid. It's, it's the M.O. is consistent, just callous and uncaring. And I mean, he, he we saw it from the, everyone. Everyone saw it. We all saw it. Just it doesn't you don't think it's going to happen until it does. In an interview with our crews in Richland, Scott says Kelly frequently did things to make all his roommates uncomfortable. I was working on my homework or something. and I'll turn around and like, you know, like, He's just be sitting there staring at you. A Fred Meyer employee told police she recognized Kelly because he was suspected of shoplifting at the store last Thursday. During that incident, another employee took a photo of Kelly near his car. Richland police say they've had low-level, nonviolent crime interactions with Kelly in the past. 
Now, the suspect did not enter a plea today for the murder charges. His bond remains at $1 million. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. In other news this evening, several West Coast states will soon drop their indoor mask mandates. California's will expire next week and Oregon's at the end of March. So the question is, maybe are we next? Governor Inslee's office says it is optimistic about COVID cases dropping and they will revisit the state's mask requirement, they said, in the near future. Now, many scientists right now are saying it's still a little too early to to end those mask mandates in today's Washington Hospital Association briefing. All of the doctors on that panel agreed it is too soon, even with case numbers going down. Personally, I think it's too soon. <laughs> um, we still have over 100 uh, people per 100,000 people having COVID every day, so I, I think it's too soon at this point in this surge. Now, both Oregon and California will still have mask rules for healthcare settings and businesses who choose to keep them. The Washington State Superintendent of Public Instruction supports ending a mask mandate in our schools. To make the next transition in this pandemic, and that is uh, likely a mask optional, but our schools are ready to make this transition. Superintendent Chris Rakedahl says it's not his decision to make, but he would like to see families make their own decision. So what are the current coronavirus numbers? Well, the west side of Washington has been declining and Spokane is closely following behind. Now today, 370 new cases were reported. Spokane's two week case rate is 2,370 per 100,000 residents. Currently 205 people are hospitalized. That's according to the regional health district. That number is a difference of 22 new people hospitalized since yesterday. And in North Idaho, 301 new cases reported today and 104 people currently hospitalized with the virus, and that's five fewer than yesterday. Well, the Washington portal to order free at home COVID test has now reopened this time. More than a million tests will be available. Washington state residents can order up to five tests. They are completely free, but only while supplies last. This is the third time the state has made tests available like this. Tests are expected to arrive within a few days of those orders being placed. All right, let's take a quick break and switch gears over to weather. Very sunny today. I mean, we can call it warm. It wasn't like summertime, but it actually felt pretty nice. Hey, out we there. were in the teens not too long ago, That's so right. it certainly felt warm. Meteorologist Tom Sherry joining us. Tom, is this nice weather going to stick around for several more days? Yeah, I, do. I think through the weekend we've got some fairly nice weather to enjoy. Nice and mild. Uh, we saw the sunshine today. Then in the afternoon, the clouds rolled in around 3 p.m. Still cloudy skies out there. We're at 40 degrees. Winds are calm right now. We actually saw some rain move through the lower Columbia Basin and into areas of southeastern Washington, and you can see even a few uh, showers uh, over in Kootenai County, a little bit east of Coeur d'Alene. That has just developed uh, within the last 30 minutes or so. We'll look for mostly cloudy skies uh, overnight with a low of about 30, 43, the expected high on your Wednesday under partly cloudy conditions. And then for the weekend, I've got more comfortable weather. The average high is 38, daytime highs getting up to 45 after the overnight lows drop down into the upper 20s. I'm going to show you the 10 day outlook coming up in a few minutes. Well, this week is Boomtown Week here at Creme 2, and we are highlighting how our area is rapidly growing. Now, of course, when you think of our region and growth, then you're going to think of housing or maybe updating transportation. But this area is also growing a lot when it comes to sports. That's why we have our sports director, Brenna Hello. Green, to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we just saw the podium open just a few months ago. So what's next for Spokane? Well, what happens to be next <laughs> is just a few steps away from the podium and it just broke ground a few weeks ago. In a year and a half, these sounds will create this sound. When they started to peel up the earth, it, it got everybody's heart going. Spokane's downtown stadium is going from concept to reality. Our earthwork and our preparation will go on through March and April, and then we'll start to bring the building out of the ground in in May probably and we'll construct the buildings and the and the fields until 2023 the August of 2023 September. The three level stadium will serve as home for all of the city of Spokane's public school football teams and a USL team. That's a lot of programs to call one place home. So the designers made sure that when a team is hosting, it truly feels like their field. It was really important to us at Spokane Public Schools to make home stadiums. It'll be an LED light 
display around the exterior of the stadium. It'll be a raise the flag. It'll be individual banners and um, colors inside the stadium as well. What could make this stadium unique to all other outdoor stadiums in Spokane, though, goes far beyond LED lighting. We're hoping to get a large video board, which would include all the things that go with a video board. So that that'd probably be our biggest toy. The school district is also looking to incorporate the now replaced Joe Alvey's history into their new stadium. For example, the plan is to relocate the Joe fan statue and the original Memorial Stadium plaque to the district's new digs. It's not just about the past or the now, though, for the building's constructors. We kept an eye on the future to make sure that we didn't put any infrastructure in position that would limit us. And so we do have that ability to expand 10, 15 years down the earth, or five, whoever knows. But um, so we made the east side of the stadium adaptable for another level of bleachers. We made other areas available for larger concessions, all those things that would go with a larger stadium. But we would be remiss to do a piece on the downtown stadium and not mention the biggest thing that held it up for so long, parking. What's the latest on that? We feel that we, we have plenty of parking um, with, the new, uh, with the new areas around the facilities. I know that, we're, that the Public Facilities District is, is always looking to, to improve those kind of things, and, and we, think, um, we think we're covered. By the way, all parking for SPS events will be free. It will be taken care of by the district, um, so nobody needs to worry about extra costs there. Yeah, that's a big one for sure. That's a right? huge one. I My think goodness. people will be very excited to hear. I that. mean, the renderings of the stadium look great, right? Yeah, so. it looks beautiful. Very it's it's going to be really nice for Spokane to have a facility like that. And obviously, you know, bringing a USL team in mm -hmm. that right. would have only happened with that new facility in downtown. It would not have happened right. if they would have rebuilt Joe Alby. And I like how they're going to at least have some you know things in place to where the home team will actually feel like they're yeah. playing on their home field. Right? It's a great idea. Cool yes. stuff. Thanks very right, much. Thank Brent. you very much. Thank you. Well, from football to concerts, rodeos, and auto races. Joe Albee has hosted a lot of Spokane history, and we want to see yours. So here are a few that you have sent us. One memory the viewer sent us was when a bull got <laughs> out and ran up the bleachers. Oh, that's a I great remember. memory. Yeah. <laughs> I guess depending on right. how it ended. <laughs> Others are kind of simple high school memories, but just as great. One viewer sent in uh, a memory of watching her daughter get crowned homecoming queen oh, there. there and the list goes on and on. So please continue to text us your memories of Joe Albee to 509-448-2000. And we will make every effort to make sure they get featured right here on our broadcast. And it is the end of an era because that is, mm -hmm. I mean, has just been an institution here in Spokane for so long. Right. I think a lot of people, as excited as they might be about this new stadium, a little sad to see that one go. Yeah, change is tough, yeah. right? And it's been an institution. I mean, for so long it's been yeah. there, right? And then all of a sudden it's not going to be there. So it'll take time. It's going to be different. The new one will be nice. Absolutely. All right, as we continue now with our Boomtown coverage, Washington Democrats have now presented a new transportation package for the state that could actually help finish the North-South Freeway three years ahead of schedule. I spoke with Representative Marcus Riccelli today, and he told me the freeway project is fully funded, but if today's proposal is ultimately approved, it could actually move up completion to the end of 2026. And guys, that's not that far away. It includes $16 billion worth of projects statewide, including a rapid bus line for STA, a land bridge to reconnect parts of the East Central neighborhood, plus a fleet of hybrid electric ferries over on the west side. It would all be paid for through a number of increased fees, like maybe license plate renewals, but not with a new gas tax. Republican lawmakers, though, they're calling this proposal partisan, saying they also had no opportunities for input.